Hi, I'm Len Davis, a Seattle-based filmmaker, and I'm here in Duval, Washington at the Mosswood Hollow Retreat Center with Robert Moss, who is leading a workshop that I've come to attend, a writing workshop about conscious dreaming. I'm working on a specific project that I was interested in some of your insights about Robert, and I wanted to ask you a couple questions. One of the things that I'm interested in is engaging with strangers and in your writing that I've read and in your talks that I've listened to, you often talk and tell stories about your interactions with strangers. And I'm curious about your ideas about why that appeals to you. You seem to be someone who really opens yourself up to and goes out of your way to engage with strangers. And I'm interested in what role that plays in your life and why you enjoy doing that. Well, then let me say what I say to strangers when I meet them, typically on an airplane, for example, or an airport, tr situation in transit, the transitions of life. I will say by way of introduction, I'm a storyteller, and what I like to do is to help people find their bigger and braver story and live that story and tell it so well it wants to take root in the world. At that moment, a conversation will often flower immediately. Someone might say, well, what do you mean? I'll say, well, tell me a story from your life. What do you mean? A story of any kind, a dream, an incident, something that happened in the office. I mean, my attitude is that everybody has a story. We live by stories. Many of us don't recognize that there's a larger story stalking us than the one that we might be living. So in my interactions with strangers, I'm open to the entertainment value of whatever comes up in that interaction. And that gets me through my constant travels. But I'm also very alert to the possibility of helping people to recognize their ability to step out of a small and limited story in their lives, maybe one handed down by a history of family dysfunction or old attitudes, and step into the power of that bigger story, that mythic power. So that's the game that I like to play. Nice. And where is the overlap between the worlds of story and dream, which is obviously central to much of what your work involves? A lot of the ways that our bigger story hunts us is in our dreams, because in waking life, sometimes we're like sleepwalkers. We're bound to schedules and calendars and other people's expectations and trying to fit in and trying to get things done in TikTok time. In dreaming, especially in spontaneous night dreams we haven't asked for and may not want, something larger can get hold of us because we're available. We're in a field of action. This is something that Westerners often don't understand. Dreams are a field of action, a field of interplay between the dreaming self and other powers, aspects of the greater self, transpersonal encounters, etc. So in my native Australia, the Aborigines, the first people, say the big stories are hunting the right people to tell them. This is part of my attitude to life. The big stories are stalking us. And the way to find your bigger story is to put yourself in a place where you are easy to find, easy to be seized. And dreaming is a place where the ordinary self gets out of its limitations and its blockages and becomes available to those greater powers. That's why dreaming is so central to story. And the practice of telling dreams and sharing them in the right way is great practice in storytelling and story making on an everyday basis with stories large and small. One of the things I've heard you say is that part of your larger life's mission is to introduce, you know, to encourage dreaming or to introduce more people to getting in touch with their dreams. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, I've dedicated my life to rebirthing a dreaming society, which means a society in which dreams in both senses, dreams of the night and dreams of life, are cherished and shared and supported in community. I mean, in, in traditional cultures, in traditional dreaming societies, the first business of the day is to sit down and share dreams and see whether the dreams, are, for example, are showing something about what the soul wants that the community can help the dreamer to fulfill because the understanding is that you know your dreams are showing you what your deeper self wants in your life and if you don't honor those dreams you end up in a sad state you lose part of your vital energy you lose part of your soul and the dreams might also be survival information for the community showing us challenges and, and opportunities that lie ahead so i would like to see us return to a situation in which we are welcoming dreams at the breakfast table first thing in the day in a corner of the office at work, amongst friends, amongst families, and cherishing dreams for their entertainment value, for their story value, for their healing potential, and for the kind of guidance and energy for getting through life's ups and downs that dreaming gives us. So this is what I do. I mean, we almost lost our dreaming in the West on a popular level. People still remember dreams, but often they don't have a way to talk about them or make them part of a family or a community situation. We need to get this back, and we need it now. Mm. I was struck by 
so I'm working on a film that's largely about my interviewing and interactions with strangers over the past 20 years. And I was setting off onto a retreat about six months ago. And as I was packing up my stuff, the car was ready to go. And I looked around my office for some reading material to bring. And a book that a friend of mine had given me 10 months earlier had been sitting in my office and I hadn't paid much attention to it. And it happened to be your book, The Three Onlys, uh, Dreams, Coincidence and Imagination. And I brought that with me and I started reading it on the first day and it immediately became a useful tool in my couple weeks of retreat for a sort of different piece of my reflection and also for some of the ideas about framework of how I could approach uh, my film about interacting with strangers and stories that people are sharing. Um, and in your book or in one of your lectures that I listened to, I came across your term chiromancer, which I really gravitated toward because it was a title and a name for a way that I had always identified with being in the world. Can you tell me about what that means and not just its definition, but really what it means to you in terms of a way of being in the world? Well, the dreamer's way of operating 24-7 is to navigate by synchronicity. Keep your eyes open, pay attention to signs, symbols, coincidences, pop-ups in the world around you. Jung gave us the word synchronicity because, frankly, we don't know how to talk about coincidence. The word has almost been lost. We say it's only coincidence. We mean it was coincidence, but it means something. There's something going on here that's really interesting. So I was looking for a word that could be a synonym for coincidence or synchronicity, and I didn't immediately find one. Then I thought, what we really need a term for is the practice, the practice of observing synchronicity, navigating by it, seizing those moments of opportunity, which sometimes coincidence gives us. And I reflected on the fact that there are two Greek gods of time. There's Kronos, that's tick-tock, linear time, chronology, clock time. And there is Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, who is depicted as a handsome young man who's naked except for a lock of hair across his forehead. Hence we get the phrase, grab time by the forelock. He personifies for the Greeks that moment of jump time, opportunity time, when things are working differently and you might have a real opportunity if you can seize that moment and notice things, time is running differently. Different forces are coming together. The universe is getting personal. You're not alone. Seize that moment. So I put the word kairos, meaning the special moment, the special opportunity time moment, the moment of kairos, together with the mancy, which is about divination. So chiromancy, or the practice of the chiromancer, is divination, getting messages about life and what's going on from in special moments of synchronicity. But it actually means more than that. It means being poised to note those moments and then act in those moments when interesting things become possible. What are some of the sort of most approachable tenets of a way an average person who's not already activated in this work or aware of seeking it sort of embrace that approach to life? Well, I offer games. I offer games and stories. I mean, I have a model of understanding. I have a theory about these things, but I find it more fun to people to give people games to play and stories to juice them up to play those games. So, for example, I tell people, you can play sidewalk tarot or highway tarot. I seed the idea that the world is dealing us divination cards, like tarot cards, but not just 78 of them, thousands of them. Anything that pops up in your field of perception can be the tarot card of the day, delivered by that overheard conversation on the cell phone or that novelty played on the car. And you can play sidewalk or highway or beach tarot in various ways. You have a theme on your mind. You step out of the house. You step out of the apartment. You go down the street with this in your mind. I would like guidance on such and such. Now, the first unusual, unexpected thing the world gives me is going to be a direct message, a direct message from the oracle of the universe on my theme. It's amazing how quickly that can work. Another version is just to give you some yourself a period of unscheduled time, otherwise unscheduled time, to wander around or be in the park and use all of your senses and collect three things that the world seems to be saying to you in the movement of those birds, in the movement of wind on the lake, in uh, the kid's chalk drawing on the sidewalk. Collect three impressions and make a story out of them as if you're discussing symbols from a dream. The point is, the world around us is also a dream and we can inhabit that dream uh, with open eyes if we're willing to pay attention. This actually is easy access for many people in our culture to the wider fields of dreaming, because a lot of people are undergoing a dream drought. and They have not been socially discouraged from paying attention to dreams. They've got no social reward for sitting down and talking about dreams. So sometimes the way to turn open the faucets of the night dreaming again is to pay attention to the dreamlike symbols of the day. And then that brings everything together. 
Nice. One of the themes that while I'm doing my work in the U.S., because I've also been doing these interviews all over the world, but is engaging people with the idea of or in asking people, how does the work that you do, you also live in this country, even though you weren't born here, and I'm curious about how your work around dreams informs your ideas about America as a place, or the United States more specifically. Well, America's great, made a great contribution to dream work. Let's notice that. The dream work movement is essentially an American movement, and it really got underway when a clinical psychi psychiatrist called Montague Ullman gave us the phrase, if it were my dream. Instead of taking, he instructed us, he guided us to stop telling each other what our dreams or our lives mean and to say, if it were my dream, I'd think about such and such. This becomes the key to various ways of sharing dreams and stories, including my own lightning dream work process, which is more action oriented. My process leads beyond analysis to action to bring creative uh, and healing energy into embodiment. But that one phrase, if it were my dream, pull back your power, don't be the expert, don't be the shrink, don't be the priest, don't be the rabbi, don't be the sheikh. Encourage people to step into the power of becoming authors of meaning for their own dreams and their own lives. With that one phrase originating with a, clinic, with a highly regarded clinical psychiatrist, uh, dreamers were liberated. And we had a method, which has flowered and been taken wings in various directions, including my direction, uh, which now makes it socially rewarding and entertaining and interesting to tell our stories to each other. So that is an American contribution. Uh, I find that people do not dream the same, same way in every culture. Within America, there are many subcultures. There are still traditional, for example, European or Asian cultures in America or African-American cultures, which have traditions of understanding and working with dreams according to specific symbols. I mean, if you're from Sicily, for example, you've been taught by your grandmother that to dream of a horse is bad because horses are demons. No kidding. I mean, no kidding. That is a traditional Sicilian view of dreams. Whereas to have dirt in your house is good because dirt is associated with money because, you know, precious metals come from the earth. So within American culture, in all the subcultures that still survive with traces of the old world or the previous country's traditions, you get styles of dreaming that are different. Native American dreaming is perhaps the quintessential American dreaming. Who are the indigenous Americans anyway, even though America is a European import as a word. The Native American concept of dreaming is very simple and very profound. It is that the most interesting dreams involve traveling. You go somewhere, you make an excursion in your dreams, you visit other people, you visit the dead, you visit the spirits, or maybe someone comes visiting you. It's a visitation. And the, the other elements of the Native American understanding are that dreams may be wishes of the soul. They might show you what the soul wants as opposed to the ego. And thus it becomes very important if we care about each other as decent human beings to listen to each other's dreams with the idea that maybe this person is being instructed by their soul, by the depth of themselves, about things that they need in their lives to be well and to contribute to the community. Maybe we should help them. And another traditional Native American concept is that dreams are part of survival because they show us in, in hard times where to get food in the winter. They show you where the enemy lies in ambush along the trail. So when we talk about American dreaming, maybe we should slip loose from the idea that we're talking essentially about modern culture and remember that amongst the indigenous peoples of North America, as amongst all our ancestors, if we go far back enough, there is a profound teaching and pro profound practice of dreaming as divination, of seeing the future, seeing what wants to happen in your life and your world, and a profound tradition of dreaming as healing. And part of what, should, what will show you what's right and wrong in your body and what's right and wrong in your emotions and right and wrong in your soul. And that is perhaps, if we get to it, the depth of the American dreaming that we need to access today. When I listen to you, I also just think of the axiom of the idea of the American dream yes. of the bootstraps model of sort of yes. you arrive as an immigrant and you work yes. hard and you get yes. rich. And when we, when, we, when we spread the wings of our understanding that way, we also remember Martin Luther King, I have a dream and how powerful that phrase is. I mean, as I say, I'm interested in rebirthing a dreaming society in, in two senses. A society that values dreams of the night, dreams that are expeditions, dreams that are glimpses of a deeper reality, and a society that helps, where we help each other to realize the fundamental life dreams that we carry and to grow a dream of community, of peace and healing for the whole population. The, the, the word dream used to be the most, fav most favorite word in advertising because it's used in so many ways. Your dream home, your dream partner, joyous expression, if we'll just uh, reclaim our relationship with it. Mm -hmm. I have a dream that that will happen. And another thing that came so clearly to me is the, or just that the idea of dreaming, I think is so 
centrally associated, you know, typically with the sleep and much of what I'm hearing in the more I'm becoming familiar with your work is how much dreaming can take place out of the, the, the sleeping space. Uh, and especially in the liminal space between being awake and being asleep. Well, for me, dreaming is not fundamentally about what happens during sleep, although we have fantastic adventures and make fantastic discoveries in sleep dreams. Dreaming is fundamentally about waking up. I mean, in waking life, sometimes we are like sleepwalkers. As I said earlier, sometimes we're so bound to other people's expectations and schedules, we don't know what it's all about. We're just trying to make the moves that are expected of us. In dreaming, in interesting dreams, we wake up, and that could happen in sleep dream. It could happen in the liminal space between sleep and awake, where I like to spend a lot of my time. It could happen on the roads of ordinary life when we're over the synchronicity. It could happen in a shamanic journey. It could happen in meditation. So these are all modes of dreaming. And, uh, and actually, when you look at the etymology of words for dreams in many cultures, you often find that the sleep aspect is not, is not, fe is, is not featured. In Latin, the same word is used for sleep and dreams, but in many, in many cultures, many traditions, the word for dream says something about what's going on beyond sleep itself. For example, to go South American for a moment, the Makiritaria, shamanic dreaming people of Venezuela, call a dream an adekato. It means a journey of the soul. That's an interesting way of looking at dreams. In the old, an old Iroquoian term for uh, for dreaming uh, means uh, it also means I bring myself good luck. Not just I get lucky, but I bring myself good luck. There's something in the language that says that without dreaming, you're not going to be fortunate because dreaming is a way of reaching beyond where you are to things that you could be or could bring to you. So, you know, featured in the idea of dreaming in traditional cultures is often the idea that dreaming might be about traveling, about seeing the future, about bringing yourself luck, about traveling across time. There's an old Scots Gaelic word for a certain kind of dreamer, bruja de rige, which means basically this is someone who can dream across time. This is someone who is a time traveler in their dreams. So when you dig into the roots of our human experience, and language is sometimes a good way to do that, you begin to understand that our ancestors understood that dreaming is about all sorts of things. Not just I lay down, I had a dream, or a dream had me. It, during my sleep, but dreaming gives you power to travel across time, gives you, it gives you a direct line to the sacred, gives you a way to converse with the ancestors, gives you a way to socialize with other dreamers uh, out of the body or in the second body, and much else. Great. So, Robert, you've given people a very short and effective, approachable framework to thinking about and interpreting dreams. Can you explain it to me in, in a nutshell? Well, we need a way to talk to each other about dreams and life stories that makes it safe enables us to get non-authoritarian helpful feedback and guides us to take action to bring the energy of a dream, for example, into ordinary life, not just analysis, but energy for guidance and healing. So I invented what I call the lightning dream work process. It, I call it lightning because it's meant to be fast. It's meant to focus energy like a lightning bolt. And it's got four steps. Number one, if you're helping someone, if you're the friend who's listening to the dream, you assist them to tell the story as simply and clearly as possible and give it a title. So that's step one, get the story with the title. There's such power in being able to tell our story in a way that others can hear it. Hear it. So this is very, very important. Number two, if you're the friend, you ask a few essential questions, so basically three. How do you feel about this? How did you feel coming out of the dream? How do you feel around the incident? Number two, reality check. What do you recognize from this in the rest of your life and could it play out in some way in the future? Number three, what do you want to know about? Where's your curiosity? Step three, you give comments, you give feedback on your friend's dream or story in the correct way. The correct way is to say, if it were my dream or if it were my life, if it were my experience, and you're now entitled to say anything you like because you're not claiming the power of interpreting someone else's situation. You're helping them to find their own meaning, if it were my dream. And then finally, you want to get an action plan. Your dreams require action. There might be something you can do to create from the dream. You might need to do some shamanic shopping and get something in the color red. You might need to contact someone. You might need to do some research. So what is your action? And for temporary closure as part of the action plan, I ask people to come up with a bumper sticker. What is a one-liner, a slogan, a mantra coming out of this dream and this discussion which carries the energy forward? So that's it in a nutshell. It's simple. Once you've mastered those four steps, you find you can do them just about anyone, just about anywhere. It makes it safe. It makes it fun to share our most intimate stories, and we can do it in almost no time wherever we like. Great. Anything else that you would like to share? <laughs> 
there always is. May your best dreams come true and may you remember them. Nice. I'm Len Davis, a Seattle-based filmmaker with Pangeality Productions, and I'm here with Robert Moss uh, doing a writing workshop about conscious dreaming. I'm working on a film about 20 years of spontaneous interviews with strangers that I've been doing. It's a documentary, and in the process of thinking through what my story is and the narrative to tie all these other stories together, uh, I found his work, and that's what brings me here. Robert, thank you so much for sharing some Pleasure. of your ideas and stories with me. Pleasure to dream with you, Len. Stay fresh.